Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. My name is Cameron Hudson. I'm a senior associate here at the Africa program at CSIS, and I'm grateful that you can join us today to update ourselves and hopefully shed some new light on the conflict in Sudan. For anyone who's paid the slightest attention to the nearly eight months of fighting going on there, you know that the country and increasingly the region is facing a humanitarian catastrophe of epic proportions. Sudan today hosts more internally displaced than any country in the world, and yet our ability to reach those millions of displaced continues to shrink. As the parties to the conflict continue to pay lip service to the notions of ceasefires, every day seems to bring the expansion of the conflict to new cities and towns previously untouched, as well as a deepening of the conflict within communities already plagued by violence. In the context of an ever worsening conflict, there has emerged a number of parallel efforts, some driven by Sudanese themselves and others by the international community, that have variously sought to increase humanitarian access, build an alternative civilian coalition to military rule, and enforce a ceasefire. All are very necessary goals, but have been met with varying levels of success and appear to have varying levels of credibility in the eyes of the Sudanese people. So today we have an expert panel who I think can help us gain a good snapshot of where this conflict is today, help us sift through some of the spin and PR which surrounds this conflict, and offer some reflections about what is working among these processes, what isn't working, and what the likely path forward might look like. All of our panelists have deep expertise and I would refer, to you, refer you to their full bios uh, on our event page, but I wanna briefly take a moment to introduce all of them here. Uh, first, we will hear from Bashar Ahmed. Uh, Bashar is the CEO of Shabaka, uh, a research training and advocacy organization uh, focused on issues of humanitarian response, aid architecture, and harnessing the power of local communities and the diaspora. Their research on the humanitarian response system in Sudan, available on their website, is an incredibly helpful resource that I recommend to everyone if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, Dr. Suleiman Baldo, uh, probably needs very little introduction. Uh, he's currently the executive director of the Sudan Transparency and Policy Tracker, which he founded in 2022 and which has very quickly become one of the go-to sources for really expert policy analysis on Sudan. Uh, he has, of course, had a long career at research and advocacy organizations like the Century, International Crisis Group, and Human Rights Watch, among many consultancies, consultancies uh, to international organizations. Uh, and finally, we will hear from Will Carter, who presently serves as the Sudan Country Director for the Norwegian Refugee Council. Uh, Will and NRC are one of the few international humanitarian organizations still operating in Sudan. Uh, and for those of you who follow his social media presence, you will know that he is often appearing in some of the hardest hit and neediest communities in the Sudan conflict. Uh, so we really are grateful to have him here um, to bring his firsthand experience uh, to this. He previously overseen NRC operations in places like Afghanistan, Syria, and Yemen. All of these individuals are my reference points for trying to understand the conflict in Sudan, and I'm so grateful to have them here to share their expertise with all of us today. Um, I'm going to start off by giving everyone just a couple of minutes to offer some, some opening thoughts, and then we'll jump into a discussion amongst ourselves, and then as time permits, we'll take some audience questions uh, towards the end. So with that, uh, welcome everyone, and Bashar, I want to turn it over to you for, for just some, some opening remarks. Thank you. No, uh, good morning, good afternoon, um, and thank you. Uh... Um, uh, Cameron and uh, colleagues who are here, and um, uh, it's great to be here also with Suleiman and Will um, at this event. I think we already have the, the statistics, we can go through, run through it. So um, let's get to kind of like the main points, the main, main challenges here. So um, one of, since the fighting broke out in the 15th of April, there's been very limited access. So I'll talk focus more on the humanitarian situation. Um, millions have been displaced, as Cameron has mentioned, it's the largest uh, number of uh, internally displaced persons globally. Um, and that's such a short period of time. And this is where um, you had local organizations, local groups stepping into the void. And you have the emergency response rooms uh, as uh, one example um, of that. In many ways, I think uh, 
people in Sudan, but also in the diaspora, have uh, played a key role to try to address, um, you know, the various uh, humanitarian needs and such. But in many ways, uh, leaders, policymakers, and such are have been missing in action. I think this is something that we have to be all conscious of. Sudan has dropped from the news. Um, it, it doesn't need to be news, but at least policymakers in the back end, in the, you know, the background should be doing a lot more to try to ensure protection, humanitarian assistance, reaching those who are um, in need. Um, the current uh, situation, it looks dire and it's just going to get worse. And I think it's been eight months and we've been talking about it and try to uh, realise localization, but we've been talking about it. This is the emphasis, but no action. So I think enough of just kind of speaking um, about it and wanting to do something. I think it's now to kind of step up. Um, it's just not acceptable to leave the situation as it is. Um, I will leave, uh, you know, Saleh Manuel to kind of maybe d dive in a bit more about what's been happening at the different spheres. But um, I think what it is, is um, we need leadership. We need clarity in terms of people to step up uh, to ensure that humanitarian assistance for those in need uh, reaches them uh, without any further delay. Thank you. Thanks, Bashar. Um, Suleiman, I want to I want to ask you. Maybe you can. Uh, Bashar touched a little bit there on um, the 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 need for response and protection. I wonder if you can talk about the other effort that we've seen in in Addis and other places, uh, looking at kind of where the where the civilians are, the Sudanese civilians themselves, and trying to put together an alternative to uh, to some of the leadership vacuums uh, that Bashar just touched on. Uh, thank you. Um, what we are witnessing is that the war is taking a life of its own and uh, morphing into a multiple layered complex conflict formation involving uh, multiple drivers spilling over in neighboring countries and threatening regional stability. Uh, in country, on one side, we have the rapid support forces pushing ahead with the assertion of its control over Western Sudan by taking control of the five states of Darfur and now uh, moving on into Kurdufan. Uh, the uh, de facto government of the day out of Port Sudan is content to basically have its authority over half of the, nine, uh, of the 18 uh, federal states of the country. And a situation is uh, created on the ground of uh, a division between two areas controlled nominally, I would say, both by the Burhan uh, junta and on the other side by the repressive forces, uh, questionable, you know, on the word control. So in this situation where the war seems to be expanding, it seems to be feeding on itself, uh, civilians have not been idle. Uh, they tried to affirm their uh, agency. Uh, we have seen them meeting in Cairo, for instance, recently in a conference that brought the frontline interveners on the humanitarian crisis on the ground, the emergency rooms, the uh, professional associations of uh, health uh, professions and workers, unions of doctors and, and, and nurses and, and so on to discuss their experience and the difficulties they are encountering in, uh, you know, dialogue with international humanitarian agencies. In Addis Ababa last October, there was a meeting of civil society organization, political actors, uh, women groups, uh, and uh, resistance committees and other, uh, you know, community-based associations to agree on a wider uh, alliance uh, of all democratic civil forces pushing for the resumption of the democratic transition in Sudan and for uh, the um, uh, an end of uh, to the war. Uh, and, and that alliance, the coordination of the uh, civil democratic forces for ending the war and uh, restoring democracy has issued uh, last couple of days uh, a proposal for a roadmap to end the war and to restore democracy in Sudan. It basically emphasizes the Jeddah platform, uh, the facilitators, the US, Saudi Arabia, and now IGAD, African Union, uh, joining forces with them uh, as the platform 
uh, of preference to consolidate uh, contributions of neighboring countries and in other international actors to, to you know, push for uh, a peace. And they propose uh, specific uh, uh, steps that Jeddah could, uh, you know, follow uh, to reach, uh, you know, a political stage in the peace process that would allow the participation of all civil forces emphasis with the exception of the National Congress Party and the Islamist movement uh, to agree uh, on an end to the conflict and uh, restoration uh, of civilian-led uh, democratic uh, transformation. So this is quite significant. And I think now that this uh, roadmap has been proposed, it may inspire uh, some uh, you know, energy and, and vitality into the uh, so far very uh, slow uh, democratic interve diplomatic intervention for ending the conflict. Great. Thank you very much, Suleiman. Uh, Will, I want to turn it over to you. Um, you. Your name has come up a couple of times in this Ca Cairo conference, which I know you were uh, attending a few weeks ago. Um, maybe you can just give us a sense of uh, really how grave the situation is right now and where, where you see it going and, and what some of the, the outcomes of that of that conversation in, in Cairo look like and what the international community can be doing now to, to support those uh, initiatives. I think you are mute, Will. I'm not hearing Will. Is anybody hearing Will? Nope. <laughs> We're not hearing Will. Maybe on the on the back end, we can uh, we can have someone look into uh, Will's microphone. Apologies. Um, well, while while we sort out Will um, Suleiman, why don't I why don't I turn back to you and and uh, Bashar? Um, you know, one of the things that was 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 referenced at the beginning by Bashar was this idea of protection uh, of civilians. And this is something that has struck me. Sorry, Will, are you back with us? I'm not, I'm not, maybe log back out and log back in again. Um, apologies. The, uh, the, um, the idea of civilian protection um, feels like it has been uh, not a part of the, at least the public conversation that's been going on. We talk about aid access, um, but even there, we're not talking about the kinds of robust uh, mechanisms that you hear talked about in other conflicts. And I think it stands in stark contrast to some of the conversations we've been hearing around uh, Gaza and the like with, with respect to pauses and humanitarian corridors, and frankly, things that were used in Darfur 15 years ago. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, uh, first, why that is, and and also, um, do we need to be transitioning to a conversation, certainly in West Darfur, about protecting communities, actually taking uh, much more robust efforts, uh, not just to get them aid access, but to prevent their displacement, to prevent the the kind of mass atrocities um, that are going on today. I just. You know, I was part of this this whole process that grew out of the Darfur movement to create a program on mass atrocity prevention. Um, and we're seeing that playbook kind of sit on the shelf right now uh, in Sudan, not being employed or, or even discussed in any kind of serious way. And I'm, I'm curious, both of you, why why we think that that might be the case. Um, I can just kind of like briefly so maybe um Suleiman can speak more about um what could be the next step um also will with that so um we'll, we'll catch you up i think hopefully we can hear you now um i'll just briefly say about protection of civilians has been become paramount and there's not humanitarian access um one of the things we've, we're seeing is the mistake that all organizations were based in Khartoum, um and then now everyone kind of relocating to port sudan the distance between Port Sudan 
and El Ginena in West Darfur is the same as London to Warsaw. So it's like crossing Europe. So how can you expect to deliver humanitarian assistance um, effectively on that? Um, the response on Sudan sh should be regional because uh, protection is not just for those in Sudan, but those at the borders. So we're not talking enough about those who've been displaced to South Sudan, to Chad or third country nationals. You have a lot of Eritreans and Syrians and such in Sudan and all of that. Um, and uh, supporting those who are already doing the work on the ground, who are doing the response, they need that support. So it's not just about delivering aid, but also providing support for those who are uh, at the front line. But um, I'll, uh, maybe we can check in on Will now before we... Uh... <laughs> Over to you, Cameron. Sure. Well, why don't we let why don't we let Will try to come in? I think he's you're on mute right now. How about that, Will? Does it work now? Yes. Okay. Can hear you. Fantastic. I am sorry. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, to start, I guess, with protection, it's um, clearly what's happened in Sudan has been a protection crisis. You know, right from the get go, within a few hours, we saw air strikes on the capital city. Um, yeah, you know, and hundreds of thousands of people flee in different directions to become largest displacement crisis on the continent at least um and perhaps soon in in the world um so it's a really devastating picture from a humanitarian aspect um on the ground i, I spent the first few months of this with our teams in eastern sudan where a lot of people from Khartoum had fled to and um yeah very very little aid was getting through this is an underfunded crisis but the operational capacities were also you know, fairly fairly weak at this point. All the uh, headquarters in in Khartoum, the capital, all the banking systems and telecommunications, all the manufacturers, all the main warehouses, you know, all, all completely wiped out. Um, and in that respect, Sudan's a very uh, difficult operational crisis. You know, even the mega crises of Ukraine and and Syria, it's not the capital cities that that are, you know are first to to fall, and some some critical basic services continue. So it was already a tough starting point to that, um, but as you as you say, the the, the protection situation really um, you know caught caught fire. We've got almost three different conflict dynamics. Of, of course, the main you know civil war between um, you know the Sudanese armed forces and, and the rapid support forces, but also the ethnic violence, including targeting civilians in in the Darfur region, and a, and a different and a third sort of military front in the in the quarter fan area which is almost completely neglected so it's you know it's been it's been been difficult and almost you know a half half of the 50 million people or so of Sudan are estimated to need humanitarian assistance at the moment and probably you know less than 15 or 20 percent of those have been assisted in the last eight months so although this is still millions of people having life-saving assistance um it's still uh, you know a small minority of what is what is needed and um as Bashir and um you know Suleiman have flagged we've seen huge local efforts not just from the Sudanese spirit of hospitality and generosity and and opening homes for not just your family members but but strangers as well um but we saw local efforts really kick start in some of the displacement affected areas but also in in, in hard to reach and conflict affected areas like Khartoum, but also in the Kordofans and Darfurs and other parts where there just isn't much um, international aid getting through. So it's um, it's a bleak situation. And to be honest, we're bracing for it to get worse next year. Um, you know, famine is not off the table. Um, there are some of the worst types of atrocities being committed and very little to contain them and a, a collapsing state um you know getting healthcare education systems but also basic banking you know across the country unlikely and unlike some of the other crises this is a huge country you know we're talking of the order of you know millions of people it's twice the size of or twice the number of people than in in syria so the numbers are huge, that the funds are low and the operational capacity is quite weak and, and local responders are still somewhat excluded. And, and that was part of the interest in, in this conference in Cairo. Uh, it was um, whilst there was you know, the military ceasefire platform in Jeddah and a political platform in, in Addis, this was supposed to be a very humanitarian focused one and led on the initiative of, of um, parts of Sudanese civil society. 
it's always difficult to get um you know everyone to 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 the table and that that's always going to be an issue but what i you know i liked me, meeting the you know local responders we you know helped many of them ourselves but other organizations have as well and um we see it as a starting point to to a conversation where our usual way of responding to crises you know the un led the intergovernmental system doesn't always work so so well in 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 countries and contexts where um you know clearly the government is a part of the conflict and only controls a portion of the country and in this case not necessarily even the capital city itself um so it 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 charted out some 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 areas of, of what what could be done on on social protection on on healthcare on on some of the food security and nutrition and other things it definitely wasn't a fait accompli and is more of the beginning of a conversation i think it also helped raise the profile of what local and mostly voluntary response has um has been able to do and start some, some of the discussions about how it can be better supported and not just recognized but included um so it's just a starting point um and uh yeah we may need parallel systems of, of humanitarian aid some working in in do i say the government controlled areas in, in northern and eastern sudan and you know different model in khartoum and darfur and kordofan um so you know we, it's the the overall humanitarian response isn't going so well um right now but millions are still being reached and um you know people in some of the worst parts of the country are still receiving assistance by by local efforts and also by some international efforts um we've got to prepare for the worst but we've got to do it differently in the coming coming months and there's still you know huge amounts to play for so I, it, it, it's not perfect but there is the beginnings of a way of a way forward cameron uh, that's great to hear. I want to just press you on one question that has kind of on the on everyone's mind right now, which is the potential for this coming fight in Fasher. Uh, we're seeing armed factions uh, coming back into uh, to Fasher right now. Um, and I think everyone is sort of bracing for for the worst uh, to see uh, this capital like the other capitals in, in Darfur. Uh, contested, uh, but that this one might might draw in uh, more armed actors, might draw in more uh, tribal communities, uh, and really begin to 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 change the nature um, or exacerbate the nature of some of the ethnic violence that we've seen. What would be the likely uh, humanitarian uh, fallout? Is the community poised to be able to respond um, to to the fall of of Al Thasher? And if it were to fall. Um, and we were to see the RSF really kind of complete or consolidate its total control over this region. Um, what is the conversation like with them about uh, about humanitarian access, or is there a conversation with them about humanitarian access? Thanks. Yeah. So, as you say, you know, it's perhaps one of the last parts of Darfur to 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 not have been seized or, or surrendered or, or, or whichever in the last few weeks um and it will risk an even more gruesome outcome in this in this in this conflict um already there is very minor humanitarian work there is you know there's still trucks and convoys there's, you know we still got offices opened in parts of, of Darfur but the reality is most most bases are closed um there isn't a strong pipeline so already it's uh, you know there's not much of a response to to the huge scale and urgency of what is currently happening in Darfur, regardless of um, what may or may not happen in in, in the other city of Alfasha in North Darfur. So uh, I'm not optimistic for a sort of save the day um, rally or approach to to what, what what is happening. And if anything, it's going to become much more complicated. We're going to have a very more, a very much more fragmented picture of who controls where and how we can get aid, you know, from different areas across multiple lines of control. So it will become very, very messy operationally, let alone the the, the violence and and some of the civilian protection requirements that you know seem to have been been forgotten in in the, in the last few years. So we don't. It uh, doesn't all go well, unfortunately, and um, really should be ringing much more alarm bells and more senior officers than it is at the moment. Um, 
In terms of access, well, I mean, we face, you know, the international community still faces huge bureaucratic and administrative impediments coming in from, from you know, the Sudanese armed forces controlled parts of, of Eastern Sudan. We still don't get all of our visas issued. There are still issues with um, using multiple border crossings for, for humanitarian supplies, uh, getting things across front lines. You, know, you saw some of the medical NGOs um, uh, release statements that they couldn't get sort of basic um, you know, maternal health supplies into Khartoum. Um, you know, so it's um, it's not easy to, to work from, from the eastern side. Um, there is a pipeline I've set up from Chad. The UN still has some bases in eastern Chad. They're doing day missions there. So the aid is is, is flowing. Um, we we don't have the same bureaucratic issues in in, in Darfur, um, but clearly a much more logistically and operationally difficult area as it stands. Thanks, uh, Suleiman. I want to I want to return to um, to your opening remarks and and again just just get a little better sense from you of how the sort of coalescing civilian uh, groups that, that met in Addis and that have, have uh, come forward with this, uh, this sort of charter uh, for, for resolving the war. Can you explain to us a little bit more how, that, how th those civilians largely outside the country are connecting back to uh, civilian demands from inside the country, and and do you see any concerns or problems? Because you see on certainly Sudanese social media um, the sense that there may be a disconnect between uh, the civilian leaders and, and those who have claimed the mantle of leadership among the civilians uh, to the people on the ground um, in the country. And so, how do we how do we bridge that gap, or or is there a gap? Uh, a credibility gap that, that you see and, and what, what more needs to be done? Uh, because again, you know, going back to 2019, 2018, the sort of the reference point of the revolution, uh, the strength of that whole process was this unity uh, among, among Sudanese across uh, political divide, economic divide, social and professional divides. Um, and the war has really exacerbated many of those divides that we see uh, and that the Bashir government for so long preyed upon uh, to keep the, the population divided. We've in some ways returned to that division. And so I'm just curious how you see the, the, the civilian leadership uh, outside the country really trying to build uh, unity and credibility with the people who, who remain trapped in Sudan. There are two levels of interventions, Cameron, uh, with regard to practical uh, operational uh, facilitation of the efforts of the civil society organizations and grassroots groups intervening in the humanitarian response uh, on the ground. And here you find that communities of exiled Sudanese in North America, in, in Europe, particularly, you know, United Kingdom, uh, and elsewhere in Europe, but also Australia and elsewhere in countries of exile, the Arab Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and so on. There has been a sort of uh, financial mobilization with uh, groups or individuals uh, maximizing their uh, remittances, transfers to populations that are exiled within the country or to those who fled to neighboring countries such as Europe and so on. The main impediment there has been the difficulties uh, of financial transactions across borders uh, in regard to the collapse and, and, and uh, you know, failure of the financial systems in Sudan and the banking system in the country. But still, uh, resources are flowing from Sudanese in exile uh, to support the volunteers uh, on the ground who are putting together reception centers for IDPs and operating health school and, and, and hospitals and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, business community has been active at that level as well. There is a political level and the Sudanese, you know, in exile are of course uh, not under the same kind of pressures uh, as those on the ground. And we find that there is a certain level of idealism and, and of uh, perhaps uh, pressure for radical responses, not necessarily very realistic. Uh, that are expected from the leadership of the new coalition, which is now being uh, formed. Uh, and therefore, there are tensions there, but still, despite all the tensions, all the challenges, uh, I see that the uh, 
coordination uh, of uh, civil democratic forces for ending the war and restoring democracy is uh, slowly but certainly uh, making uh, progress and contributing uh, such as this roadmap uh, for uh, ending the war and, and for uh, restoring a civilian-led uh, democratic transition. One key uh, step in the uh, uh, proposed roadmap is for the Jeddah process to enforce uh, the uh, you know you know the humanitarian cessation of hostilities, uh, and the roadmap calls for cooperation of civilian actors with the belligerents. Uh, you know, uh, acknowledging realistically that they should have a role in facilitating uh, the uh, convoys of, of relief supplies and and uh, you know getting uh, supplies to where they are most needed. Uh, you know, in this very dire situation. So that's uh, that's what's happening now uh, on the civilian front uh, at this level. But can I just press you on on that point about how this uh, this conversation in Addis is is uh, fitting into and 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 reinforcing the Jeddah process? Because I think you know you see a lot of public uh, concern, frankly, among Sudanese and others uh, that the Jeddah process has not been representative of their views, that it is, you know, that people are fearful that it, it what could emerge from that is some kind of elite bargain. Um, and so is this a way to, uh, expand Jeddah and do we think that there's an opportunity, uh, or, or a necessity even to, 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 to create a kind of, uh, a bigger tent, uh, conversation that merges some of these, uh, you know, some of these tracks that we are seeing outside uh, is, I guess the question is, are, are we, is this too bifurcated a response um, or keeping these separate tracks going for the time being is a requirement and, and a necessity to, to kind of grow them. And then we can think down the road about how, how they all merge together. Well, yet uh, has been uh, and continue to be seen as um, a military negotiations. Uh, the object of which is to, you know, lead the belligerents to cease uh, hostilities and, and agree on cessation of hostilities, perhaps moving towards a permanent ceasefire. End of the story. That a political process will follow from that, which will address the broader uh, root causes of the conflict and the role of civilians in, in, in shaping the post-conflict uh, political dispensation. What the roadmap proposed by the coordination of civilian forces for ending the conflict and restoring democracy is, is uh, suggesting is that they want to be part of this you know, uh, movement from the military negotiations to the political phase of the peace process in which civilians should be sitting at the table, realistically also involving the belligerents, but without representation of the Islamists who are seen as the ones who have uh, and are pushing uh, this war and, and you know, fanning the flames of it, uh, to agree uh, on the political, uh, you know, uh, broader agreement for a post-conflict Sudan that really resolves all the underlying issues are responsible for so many conflicts and repetitive uh, civil war uh, civil wars in the country so uh, I, I don't see that there is a contradiction there it's moving the process to a, a different phase uh, with a larger involvement of facilitators mediators with the got au uh, now being included among those in, in jeddah uh, facilitating uh, the, this process thanks uh, bashar i want to turn back to you um, in your opening remarks, you 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 really hit, I think, uh, a feeling, hit on a feeling that I think is expressed by a lot of Sudanese that um, that there does feel like uh, a, an absence of of international response uh, on the military side, the political side, and the humanitarian side. We've touched on a couple of those already, but I want you to respond uh, maybe to to Suleiman's uh, you know points that that he was making because at the same time that there seems to be a, a dearth of uh, international response and momentum. Uh, clearly, there are several strains of of activity going on um, within within the international community. Certainly not enough. Certainly not at historic levels. Uh, if you look back at crisis response in Sudan over the course of uh, of the past twenty or thirty years, um, it certainly doesn't reach that level. 
Um, but I'm curious how the Sudanese themselves are viewing um, this, and 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 maybe you can expand a little bit more on what they would like to see, um, you know, done from an international response perspective. What more Washington uh, can and should be doing? I note that you know we, we we still don't have a special envoy for Sudan, which has been a kind of staple of U.S. policy. At least it's been a face of U.S. policy. Um, we haven't seen kind of a robust uh, you know, sanctions regime or other punitive measures. Um, we haven't seen the kind of uh, appeals in the UN Security Council, often driven by the US and the UK. Um, so do those things, as much as they may be uh, performative, how much do they matter and how much are they missed uh, right now by, by the Sudanese? And is that what they interpret as a lack of international response to this crisis? No, thank you, Tim. And, and uh, thank you, Suleiman. It's, it's great to um, have Suleiman kind of uh, put that kind of uh, political reflections on these things and also um, capturing it. But um, I will say, but um, generally, um, and I'll talk from my ex own experience. I've I've worked on the Darfur conflict back in two thousand three to you know um, at that time, and it's just kind of the the engagement so different, walls apart. The kind of the commitments the the groundwork that he you know the advocacy that was done is missing it's, it doesn't exist at the current time and what it is is you still have everyone is dealing with sudan as if it was before during that time this is a completely different um you know change of play mm -hmm. um this is a completely different context and i think everyone is kind of wanting to repeat the same things the risk is you have all these processes this is kind of elite politics it's the same as before you're really missing what's happening on the streets, what's happening on the ground. Because um, people want to actually, you know, the humanitarian response, where is everyone, the evacuation, when that, that happened? What's happening to those who have been displaced in neighboring countries in terms of protection? So I think there is a disconnect and it's happening again, which is we want to do Jeddah, we want to do Addis, we want to do all of this. Um, and you have so many people have been, you know, displaced. It's, it's affected every single person from the country. In the past, you would have people who were in Khartoum did not feel, you know, feel the pain of what's, what's happening in Darfur necessarily. But this is affecting every single person, every, you know, the 40 plus million people in Sudan. Half of them are in need of humanitarian assistance. And people are talking about, you know, Jeddah, let's wait in, on this and that. So there needs to be, um, you know, a, a particular approach. You need to have the immediate, um, you know, with the localization, support the groups who are already doing the work and ensure that assistance, you know, funding, support goes there and not just speaking about it. Um, in the medium term, you know, ha have these kind of pre processes going in parallel, but should not overshadow the immediate needs uh, needed at the moment. Um, and durable solutions for those in terms of protection and durable solutions in Sudan and in neighboring countries, because people's lives has been put on hold since that time. A whole country has been held hostage to, uh, you know, breaking down of infrastructure, no health facilities, nothing. So, and I think it's sometimes when you're kind of far away from it, it's very difficult to kind of envisage that. Um, but uh, it's just not kind of acceptable anymore to kind of talk about we want to support, we don't know how. The our pathway. We have done a lot of work. For example, we um, we're going to be publishing it tomorrow. We've done an um, we've done massive mappings on different um, elements uh, across the country. One of which about the emergency response rooms. Uh, Twenty nine of these who are doing phenomenal work, but the what the kind of uh, responses came from them. None of them have talked about political or that first thing they needed was you know, uh, medical um, equipment or, um, you know, specific training on that. So I think you also kind of need to listen to the realities on the ground and not just be um, stuck in elite politics. Thanks for that. Um, Will, I want to connect something you said earlier with what we just heard from Bashar about um, the response in, in Darfur. Um, you know, sometimes in Washington, you hear an argument made, which is, um, you know, that our approach to this conflict should be kind of linear, that we get to a ceasefire, you know, we get we get um, security talks and military talks, and that will enable 
uh, humanitarian access, right? That will, you know, if we can, if we can solve the the, the problem at the at the at, at the elite level, at the capital level, then all of these other kind of conflicts uh, throughout the country and all of the other uh, humanitarian access and ethnic violence that'll be resolved if we can get a kind of global deal um, at the center. And you know, you hear that a lot actually in other conflict areas as well. Um, and I think that you know, Darfur, as you mentioned, has begun to take on some very unique characteristics of violence, those characteristics we have seen before. I, I'd like to just go back to you a little bit more on um, on why I think it's critical that we treat Darfur differently in some respects in terms of access and humanitarian care. Uh, you talked about these kind of differing conflicts in uh, in and around Sudan. What are some specific things um, I guess maybe first of all, do you think that we really need a, polit a political deal uh, at, at, a, at an international level or national level in order to uh, address the needs in, in Darfur? Can we be doing these things simultaneously or should we be doing these things simultaneously? And if so, you know, what are the what are the two or three things um, that you think would really make a difference right now uh, in in Darfur that are uh, critical to either protecting people or uh, gaining access to communities that, that don't have it right now? Thanks. It's, um, uh, we absolutely do not need a global political deal to, to do better for people in Darfur right now. Um, Obviously, it's it's helpful. Obviously, it's better in the grand scheme of things. Um, but um, no, I mean we we sort of mapped out some of the scenarios, and even if there is a, a ceasefire deal, which we we hope for, um, but even then, it doesn't necessarily stop the fires in in Darfur. Uh, we still they're still quite likely to continue for many many months at the moment. There's not much stopping power to what's what's already been 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 unleashed or triggered there. Um, so we're we're bound to see, you know, in this expansive region, you know, somewhere the size of Spain or so, you know, it's a, it's a country in its own right, really. Um, many different atrocities, battles. Um, you know, there's already an issue of of, of the food supply, of um, water, healthcare, you know, basic services as well, and um, you know, unlikely that any of this will be be resolved. So I, it's it's going to get worse. You know, we're kind of dealing on the horizon with you know a looming famine there wrapped in a you know mass atrocities you know amidst the context of a failing state it's really you know a a convergence of, of multiple catastrophes in, in a very difficult part of the country so no we, we we can't wait and we shouldn't wait for a political deal what we need is is you know better operational access there that needs to be much more robust and you know we need to look at the cross-border mechanisms from that you know the un is basically out of funds and they control a lot of the common supply chain we need you know different um operational organizations to re-establish bases around darfur and more to the point with bashir and, and suleiman and, and others is we need to make sure that local and community efforts and diaspora efforts uh you know are, are better supported where any of this is, is possible. Um, it is a bit different in Darfur, but there's still great community work happening, um, even in some of the worst places. So we need to get the, the, the cross-border logistics working. At the moment, there's a you know there's a non-objection um, from Sudan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, but um, at the moment it's to, to work from Chad into into Darfur. Um, but it's uh, all quite uneasy and probably needs to be shored up um, much, much more. Um, needs to be a more robustly funded operational plan there and perhaps a different set of, of, of ground level leadership to, to engage with different, um, different groups and stakeholders, different commanders. You know, there's the assistance and relief service delivery side, but there's also the civilian protection side and trying to reduce the, the impacts of this, this dreadful conflict on people and that isn't just a sort of um, you know top level elite dialogue it's also ground level you know the track two type of diplomacy and working with you know community leaders and also other local you know security stakeholders as well to to, to do better through what's probably going to be a very long and, and grueling and bloody bloody conflict in in in, in Darfur so no we, we we shouldn't and we can't wait for 
a bigger political deal. We, we have to do better for people in Darfur right now. Thanks, Will. Um, uh, we've been getting some questions uh, from audience members who who, who registered uh, for this event in the last few days, and I, in the last uh, ten or fifteen minutes that we have left, I want to try to bring in some of the some of those questions here um, and direct them as best I can to those who I think uh, might have a view on them. Um, and I want to start. We, we've received several questions about the RSF, uh, and Suleiman, maybe I'll just turn to you on on this one. Um, uh, and I'll try to combine these questions into one. Essentially, uh, a series of questions about why do you think that the RSF has any uh, degree of support? Uh, and why do we think that uh, outside countries uh, and outside groups are supporting the RSF to the extent that they are? Um, and what more can we be doing and should be doing uh, to try to stop the the weapons flow and the financial and political support uh that are that are going to the rsf so that was a, a number of questions we've, we've gotten from the audience but maybe you can just start about where does the rsf derive any of the support that it's that it's getting right now given uh you know what is now a very well documented uh track record of mass atrocities and 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 ethnic crime some of which you know have been called called genocide recently it's important to keep in mind that the RSF are the creation of the Sudan Armed Forces from remnants of the Janjaweed Militia of 2003. The Sudan Armed Forces delegated to the Rapid Support Forces the functions of uh, foot soldiers, infantry. Uh, since their creation in 2013, they have been trained, armed, equipped, and in, you know framed for administrative personnel management issues by the Sudan Armed Forces until the moment they want to war against the Sudan Armed Forces uh, in mid-April. Second, within an agreement between Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, the Ministry of Defense in Sudan agreed to deploy Sudan Armed Forces to and, and rapid support forces to the war in Yemen. And it was the RSF that were the boots on the ground fighting on behalf of Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates. And therefore, there were payments in large amounts that uh, have yet to be, you know, uh, identified directly in real and dirham and equivalent in dollar, going to the Sudan Armed Forces on one side and to the rapid support forces. This was a major source of attraction for young people from their food from all extractions, because if you go to the rapid support forces, you have a better pay. You could be, could be deployed to the war in Yemen come back and get a one-time payment of ten to $15,000. At the time, this was, you know, enough to help, you know, this young uh, unemployed youth from Darfur, from particular ethnic groups, to have a chance to improve their lot and that of their families and so on. So a major source of support for the RSF is that it pays better than Sudan Armed Forces, that it also controls, uh, you know, uh, apart from this uh, war chest that was built because of uh, payments from, uh, you know, United Arab Emirates and in particular in Saudi Arabia, uh, the uh, rapid support forces commanders developed uh, an entire financial empire, employed people, paid them, used the rapid support forces and their own personal private businesses into uh, a way of circulating public funds received from the government of Sudan to grow the wealth of, of the commanders. The force has all the trappings of a modern army, but in reality, it remained uh, schizophrenic in the sense that it is also a tribal militia. And since this war started, the militia side of it has prevailed, and therefore a major uh, you know, strain of support is coming from ethnic mobilization. From within Sudan, by particular clans of Arab origins in North and Darfur and elsewhere in, in, in the country, but also from neighboring countries in the Sahel region, where some of these groups are, are, are within the local uh, population textures. United Arab Emirates, I don't think, has abandoned its uh, you know, geostrategic ambitions, uh, but it doesn't have the manpower or the military numbers to match these ambitions. And it will always be helpful to them to have an army for pay, which the RSF is. And I think this is the main motivation for the UAE to continue you know, 
basically supporting the RSF with the hope that if it prevails militarily in the current war, it will therefore control also Sudan resources and Sudan's geostrategic uh, assets, such as uh, the Red Sea and, uh, you know, access and, and all of that. Uh, and, and here, you know, the, the situation becomes a bit complicated because Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates are no longer on the same page with regard to the support to, to the uh, rapid uh, support forces. Final point about Russia, you know, it was Wagner Group, which found uh, a lot of interest in, in, in supporting the rapid support forces. But then the Wagner Group, since the death of its uh, founder, uh, is under re you know, restructuring. Uh, we find that there is opportunistic support from units, uh, fighting units in Central Africa Republic, but also in Libya, flowing to the uh, rapid support forces. So it's, it's a complex uh, question involving geostrategic dimensions, uh, but also ethnic dimensions that is now at play uh, in, the, in the current conflict in Sudan. Thank you. Um, Will, I, we've gotten a question about the humanitarian aid and who uh, who's providing the, the aid that is uh, coming in? Who are the, the, the largest um, donors for that aid? And a question with respect to, uh, are you able to use uh, the airports uh, in uh, Darfur to, to deliver aid? And I think there's a sort of subsequent question, which I would add on to that, which is, you know, you see... Um, in uh, military circles, a debate about whether or not the SAF should disable uh, airports in, in Darfur because the RSF may, may well be using them to import um, weapons. And so while one side might be using those uh, to benefit themselves, uh, if they were to be destroyed, it would seem that, that, that there would be uh, a real effect on the humanitarian um, you know, uh, response. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the just the, the logistics of of uh, how aid is being delivered and maybe what some of the consequences might be as we see uh, more and more of these airports and, and military bases fall to the RSF uh, and and see them controlling them? Sure, it's um, I mean this is a very underfunded response. It's maybe only a third fun, you know funded to the humanitarian appeal that the UN has launched. Um, the US is is by far the most generous donor. The European Union and, and Germany um, also also follow there. Um, but some of the other, you know, six or seven main global donors for for humanitarian aid uh, haven't really stepped up yet. And I think there's this feeling that, well, if there's no access, then why 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 bother? We've got too many other crises around the world. Um, and I think that the, the takeaway there is that there is. There is, you know, millions of people being assisted. It's certainly not great. Uh, there are huge challenges, but it is generally getting to people in, in dire need. Um, but many of those people are not in the conflict-affected parts of the country, like Darfur, like Khartoum, and like like Kordofan. Um, you know, most of the aid is going through Port Sudan into um, parts of, um, uh, of eastern and northern Sudan, where many of Khartoum's displaced you know, families have, have sought, sought shelter in. Um, but, you know, operationally at the moment, it's uh, we've overland cross-border from, from Chad um, uh, into into the country. So almost no, um, for humanitarian purposes, I'm not aware of any any, any airstrips or airports be, being used. And there's still a huge aviation security issue uh, getting, getting in or getting close. So, um you know, I was helping our team in, in West Darfur to take a helicopter to Eastern Chad and, and drive in across the border there um, with, with you know, local permissions, etc. Um, so it it's, um, hasn't really been set, set up uh, yet. Uh, I think the operational infrastructure is important. You know, we used to have a UN peacekeeping mission until 2020, um, which did shoulder a lot of the operational burden for, for humanitarian responders. And after that, that was um, dissolved. The UNAMID AU UN peacekeeping mission for Darfur. Um, you know, we, we we suffered huge operational issues in in moving around Darfur. Um, so I, I'd say that that needs to be a, a you know a, a big investment. Now, whether the UN is in a position to to reopen and fully staff all of its bases, you know, in in Darfur, it's a separate question and timeline. Um, and what local communities and what um, you know international other organizations can do in the, in the, in the meantime you know needs to be needs to be invested in so it it's um 
it's it's a complex logistical picture. At the moment, it's mostly overland, but you know the supply chain is through Chad, Libya, South Sudan. The options aren't you know aren't easy for for, for getting imports in in this way. Um, but uh, we've got to start somewhere. There's you know tw- twelve million plus people in in Darfur at the moment. Most of them you know will be at you know crisis levels of food insecurity and. You know, extreme, extreme, um, you know, risk of of other violations of their their safety, um, and I guess just to attend, you know, there's there's logistical aspects, and um, you know, there's a, a safety and security aspect too, and I think that there's, you know, there hasn't been so many direct attacks on international workers, but really, and one of the things that came out of the Cairo humanitarian conference was, you know, the importance of um, making sure that all frontline responders regardless of whether they work for an international organization or not, are, are better protected. And we, we kind of need to see the international system speak out when when local responders are, um, you know, detained, abducted, you know, uh, harmed in, in any way, as, as what's happening if we're going to, you know, preserve that that shred of, of humanitarian space in Darfur at the moment. Thank you. Uh, Bashar, I want to turn back to you in, in just the couple of minutes that, that we have left. Um, I want to get your sense of of where you think things are going. We're coming up to the end of the year here, um, and we've talked a lot about the the various uh, strains of, of of activity. What are you uh, on the lookout for going forward? Um, do you are are you, are you leaving this conversation and and with this moment in time in Sudan with the with the sense of hope uh, that you see a way forward on the horizon, or do we are we going to continue uh, this journey through hell before uh, before we start to see some some light at the end of the tunnel? Where do you where do you see this going? Um, sadly, I don't see there's going to be uh, um, it's going to get worse before it can get better and i think there's a few steps that needs to take place um this crisis is going to get worse because um we need to step up now i think well you already alluded the potential you know for famine you have a climate crisis and sudan is not kind of disconnected from neighboring countries to what's happening um across the region you have you know what's happening in somalia in terms of um uh uh there what's happening in ethiopia what's happening you know all these neighboring countries so we have to look at the crisis regionally um and i think this is one of the missing things um another layer to it is yes there's going to be political processes discussions these need to continue but that should not be uh pause other efforts so there has to be a step up for uh the humanitarian response and it um and you're going to have risk of disease and all of this so you need to put the investments now before it can get worse. And I think, um, as mentioned, only uh, about a third of the funds uh, for the humanitarian um, support assistance has come through. So a lot more work needs to be done on that. So I think it's a case of not waiting for it because you're not seeing it, but it is getting worse on the ground. The violations are increasing. The you know protection needs are increasing. Um, uh millions of children out of school um you know whole communities have you know displaced so if you haven't had the opportunity to do something i think this will be the time to to do that thanks uh suleiman i want to leave you with the last word similar similar question about where uh where you see this going especially in the context of you know we've seen some rsf statements uh recently uh, suggesting that they intend to 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 drive on Port Sudan, uh, to drive on um, on areas east of of the Nile. Many of those areas, uh, Madani and other places, uh, have seen a lot of internally displaced flee to. Uh, we've seen you know a lot of uh, the the growing areas, uh, business areas continue to function in those areas. Um, what do you think the likelihood is that we see uh, a much further expansion of this mm-hmm. of this conflict, and 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 what does that mean uh, going forward? I don't expect the rapid support forces to advance to eastern Sudan. Uh, I see the next movement to be the consolidation of full control over the five states of Darfur, and moving on on North Kordofan and West Kordofan, and there is already some movement towards uh, Mujlet uh, and, and Baba Nusa. The next step uh, would be, you know, moving on to Nuhud and uh, Al-Ubaid and so on. Uh, 
South Kurdufan would be uh, quite challenging for the rapid support uh, the, the RSF expansion because of the presence uh, of forces of the Sudan Liberation Movement and Army of Abdelaziz Al Hilo, who at the beginning of the war expanded the presence of his army into government uh, previously held uh, government areas. And therefore, the next target would be uh, control over uh, North and, and West Kurdufan and moving on to White Nile uh, state uh, to be you know, consolidating the control over the south of Khartoum, the, the area south of Khartoum. A stretch, quite a stretch to then venture into a campaign, an offensive uh, into Eastern Sudan. With regard to the situation in Al-Fashir, I don't expect that there will be a full-fledged offensive by the rapid support forces. What they are working on now is to neutralize forces of the Darfur armed movements by telling them, okay, let us join jointly work on uh, civilian protection. Let us jointly work on, uh, you know, securing humanitarian convoys coming from uh, Kosti and, and uh, through, from post Sudan through Kosti, and and this way avoid, uh, uh, you know, a full confrontation with the army and the, the full movement. And they are working on this in conjunction with the local front commanders uh, of the Darfur movements. Uh, I think this is uh, going to be the trend for the coming uh, period. Uh, otherwise, if there is a full offensive, then the humanitarian mm -hmm. situation would be disastrous. More people will be flowing into Shad. There is already half a million uh, Sudanese uh, refugees, uh, mostly from West Darfur in Shad. An entire population uprooted and uh, are now uh, in the camps of UNHCR and you know, not just uh, Adre, but beyond. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning, uh, Cameron, uh, you know, that the uh, situation in Sudan, you know, basically conjures the picture of, of uh, responsibility to protect. Sadly, we cannot count on the United Nations Security Council today to take any movement in that direction uh, of uh, humanitarian intervention in the sense of a robust, uh, you know, peace enforcement mission to protect civilians under imminent danger. Uh, of atrocity crimes and decimation, as has happened in West Darfur. Why? Because Security Council of today, as we speak now, is dismantling a political mission put in place to support Sudan's transition and, and, and the uh, establishment of lasting peace and, and democratic transition in the country. And by that, I mean UNITAMS. Uh, which the government of Burhan has uh, requested determination of, and that the, you know, given the politics of the Security Council, we can expect that Russia and, and China, in particular, will veto uh, any motion to to extend uh, the current mandate of UNITAMS, making it more difficult for the UN to continue the role it is playing today in in coordination in coordinating humanitarian intervention. And, and supporting uh, peace uh, endeavors uh, by the JEDDA process, the AU and, and the EGAP. Therefore, the international environment is a problem and it's not uh, you know, part of, uh, of the response uh, at the level of the Security Council, at least. Thanks. Thank you, Suleiman. Um, we've come up on at the end of our time for this conversation. I wanna thank you all for um, bringing your expertise to this conversation, helping us understand a little bit about where we where we are today and, and what might be uh, what might be ahead for Sudan. Um, I just want to thank you for 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 the work that you continue to do. Recommend to all of our uh, guests joining online uh, to uh, track them, follow them, follow uh, uh, Will's reports uh, from the front lines. Uh, Bashir's uh, report on the uh, emergency response rooms you can find on her website, but also at sudanccu.org. And if you don't already, please subscribe to uh, Suleiman's uh, newsletter, uh, which he puts out uh, through the Sudan Transparency and Policy Tracker, uh, which really does give expert uh, analysis of the day's events in, uh, in Sudan. So thank you once again uh, for joining and for all of our guests here today. Uh, I appreciate your, your insights and look forward to continuing this conversation with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.